Welcome, Varun. Yeah. You need yeah. this one. You have. You yours. need the uh, uh, clicker. Yeah, you need the clicker. Yeah, right. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Varun. I work on the core infrastructure team at Pinterest. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a system that we built uh, for serving batch generated data sets. Uh, so here's the overview of my talk. Uh, first I'll talk about what is uh, batch generated data, why it is interesting and useful. Uh, then I'll talk about some existing solutions uh, that are widely used in industry and were also being used at Pinterest. Uh, then I'll talk about the architecture of Terrapin um, and um, uh, why we made the design choices that we made, and also explain the usage at Pinterest. Uh, so what is batch generated data? So it's essentially any data set that's generated through ETL jobs, uh, running on Hadoop clusters like MapReduce jobs, cascading uh, pipelines, or through Hive queries. Um, it's always regenerated in entirety. For example, a MapReduce job may run today uh, and generate one version of the data set, and tomorrow it may run again and generate a newer version of the data set uh, by running on fresher input. It's not real time, but, but yet it is very powerful because you can express uh, some very powerful computations through MapReduce jobs. You don't have a constraint on, um, on how fast you need to process and so on and so forth. And there are many applications of this at Pinterest, like recommendations, uh, machine learning models and features, and joins of uh, various pieces of data. Uh, so one, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with one example of a very successful product feature on Pinterest, which is related pins. So essentially, uh, MapReduce pipelines um, uh, compute for each pin a bunch of uh, similar pins uh, to that pin. Uh, for example, in this case, these are pins related to another uh, pin which has a cute puppy on it. Uh, and we need to serve these um, right in the critical path uh, of a web request. Um, so the system has to be low latency. Uh, it has to provide high availability. And it has to provide a random key value access uh, kind of uh, data model. So these are some of the constraints which we had to take, uh, which we had to, um, take into consideration while building Terrapin. So now I'll talk about some existing technologies um, that, that or, or some, some uh, technologies that we were previously using at Pinterest uh, for serving this kind of data. So first off, we started off with our Hadoop jobs writing directly to edge-based region servers through write RPCs. Um, but then what we found that we had to severely uh, rate limit these RPCs since they were overloading our edge-based clusters. Uh, the good part of this, though, was that uh, with edge-based, uh, you can get if you're writing directly to it, uh, you get good data locality. So the data on HDFS is co-located with the edge-based region server, so the latency was good. But the rate limiting uh, made it really useful, for, uh, made it really hard for us to, um, to upload large data sets. So we, we, we could only deal with data sets which were a few tens of uh, gigabytes. Um, so then we tried the other approach, which was to generate the edge files and then bulk upload them um, to edge base. Now, the advantage of this solution was that this was significantly faster, since it was all it involved was a file copying. But at the same time, we lost data locality. So what would happen is that when a MapReduce job writes data to edge base, it will distribute the data across the entire, uh, entire cluster. So as a result, um, our latency suffered. And the only way to restore this uh, data locality and to actually get back uh, the latency, we had to run compactions. And the compactions were actually even uh, more uh, strenuous, or they added more load to the cluster than the bulk upload of edge files itself. And we also had to run these compactions to get rid of um, like any old data that was, on the, uh, that was still lying on the cluster. So this approach worked for some time, but as the number of use cases um, increased, we found that the edge base cluster was doing uh, compactions most of the time. Um, so then uh, we actually did something similar to, uh, it's not exactly ElephantDB, but kind of similar to ElephantDB architecture, where uh, instead of using edge base, uh, we just uh, would write edge files to uh, a distributed file system like S3 or HDFS, and then have a bunch of servers pull these edge files to their local disk and serve from there. I mean, it had some nice properties, uh, such as um, you could do live swapping and easy, uh, uh, like, very cheap garbage collection of old versions of data instead of running compactions uh, for systems like HBase. 
But the pain point was that, uh, I mean, it was really simple. So all it did was just to get the files once and then um, just serve them. So it had no rebalancing, fault tolerance, or elasticity built into it. And also now the upload process was two steps. So you had to first write edge files into, uh, into HDFS and then have it uh, pulled to a bunch of servers. So um, it worked well for some time, but then uh, as the footprint of the clusters uh, increased, then we used to have issues with adding capacity. Every time we added capacity, we would have to reload the whole data set to make sure that the uh, additional capacity is realized. So then we uh, just took a look at, uh, at the, these different solutions that we had, uh, uh, we had deployed in the past and looked at what are the advantages of each and the pros and cons of each of them. So HDFS, anything backed by HDFS like HBase uh, was scalable, elastic, you could easily add nodes, uh, it was easy to operate, fault tolerant, uh, you could have machines failing, and H Hadoop could directly write data to HDFS clusters, so it was fast to get your data onto the system. But at the same time, uh, this other architecture, again, kind of similar to ElephantDB, but not, not exactly the same, uh, it had some nice properties, like performance was one, uh, because the data was always served locally. Uh, it had uh, versioning of the data and live swap of the versions, um, and the garbage collection was cheap, so you didn't have to run compactions to get rid of your old data. So then we, we thought that what sh should we do? Like, should we actually build scalability, elasticity into this other architecture, or do we go with HDFS and try to squeeze out performance from that? Um, and what we decided was that if we could somehow get data locality for HDFS, given the fact that the, these data sets are only uh, updated in batch uh, and exploit that property, then we might actually, uh, then we can actually achieve all of these uh, requirements that we have of performance, uh, scalability, and you know, speed of uh, fast uploads, uh, live swap, and so on. So with that in mind, I'll go into the high-level architecture of uh, Terrapin. So essentially, um, it starts with a Hadoop job uh, at the top right uh, in the figure there, uh, which starts writing data um, in the form of some, uh, some format which can be easily looked up. In this case, we are still using edge files because we have had good success with edge base for other, um, other online applications. So it starts with that, um, and then it writes data to a Terrapin cluster. So the Terrapin cluster is essentially, there's a Terrapin server which is running on each of the HDFS data nodes. Um, and then there is, there is a controller wh whose job is to make sure that each Terrapin server at any point of time is serving the edge files that are local to uh, that HDFS data node. So yeah, the job of the server is to essentially serve data that's local to that server. So in this, architect in this architecture, we are able to achieve uh, pretty much 100% uh, uh, data locality because the controller coordinates the cluster in such a way that we are able to get to 100% uh, data locality. And we use the Zookeeper for actually uh, doing cluster coordination and notifying of any new uh, mappings. Um, uh, of the partitions. And then we also build data versioning uh, into the system uh, so that you can do like easy garbage collection of old data and you can, um, you can do other, other cool things which, uh, with versioning which I'll go into later. Uh, so another way to look at it is that uh, at any point of time there are two mappings. There's one, there's a logical mapping which is uh, the mapping from each partition. So let's say you write a bunch of edge files or partitions uh, as part of your Hadoop job, right? Um, then for each partition, there is a bunch of Terrapin servers which are serving that partition, and there are a bunch of data nodes that are serving that partition. And eventually, uh, what data locality means is that the logical mapping should converge to the physical mapping. Um, and that's the job of the controller. And the thing is that this is possible because we are dealing with uh, with uh, immutable data sets on HDFS, and HDFS is the only source of truth for the location of this data. On the other hand, with other systems like HBase, the HBase region server is responsible for the in-flight writes, while the immutable H files are uh, being distributed by HDFS. So it, it's, it's harder to do with HBase, but it's uh, easier to do if you uh, think of it in this way. Uh, one other caveat is that uh, we make sure that the H files that we are writing 
they are, they are um, they don't span more than one data block. Uh, so that way you can make sure that an H file is localized to one node. Now this is a bit of an eccentric choice, like writing H files with four gigabytes block size. Um, but we have not found any issues uh, operating this at scale. Uh, the only thing that this means is that when you're doing, um, like the unit on which HDFS operates can be up to four gigabytes for the data sets that are uh, being uploaded into Terrapin instead of being the standard 128 megabytes. Um, so yeah, I'll quickly go into each of the components uh, of uh, Terrapin. So there's a controller which basically is responsible for retrieving this physical mapping uh, from each uh, uh, from the HDFS data node, and it com uh, it does that every few minutes. Uh, it diffs that against the logical mapping, which is essentially what the Terrapin servers are are serving at any point of time. Uh, it, once it has calculated the diffs, it computes uh, it com uh, it essentially sends them over to the Terrapin server through uh, coordinating it, coordinating it through the Zookeeper. Um, and we use an open source library called Apache Helix, developed by LinkedIn. Um, it's actually used by many companies for uh, managing stateful systems. Uh, and then the uh, controller is also responsible for garbage collecting any old uh, versions. And the garbage collection is really cheap in Terrapin. It, all it does is just delete the older versions. And all of this runs in a single thread on the controller so that uh, there are no, uh, no possibilities of any race conditions between these, uh, these different uh, events. Uh, the server, uh, it just responds to what the controller is doing. Uh, it's basically uh, opening and closing edge files, reporting the state back to Zookeeper, and then it also caches the indices and the data uh, using an LRU cache. Uh, so that's, uh, that helps speed up performance. And since the data is accessed locally, it serves the lookups uh, through the short circuit local reads feature in HDFS. Uh, so in case you don't know, uh, there's a, this feature allows uh, the client, which is the Terrapin server in this case, to talk to the HDFS data node locally, have it open the file, and send back uh, the file descriptor to the client, which is just a number. And then the Terrapin server can directly access the file without having to go through a data node. So having this feature essentially means that the performance, uh, your random read performance through HDFS is at par with a regular um, uh, kind of database or, or any other embedded uh, system. Finally, the client library, uh, it's, uh, it's reading all these uh, uh, messages from, um, um, from Zookeeper, and then it is issuing, routing the reads to the appropriate server. And since HDFS is replicating, Terrapin also has uh, multiple replicas for, um, you know, for each partition. And uh, so the client can retry any failed reads on one replica against another, uh, another replica. So I'll, I'll quickly walk through an example uh, uh, to just show like the failure cases in the window during which you may see um, you may see loss of data locality and hence performance. Uh, so let's say you have a two-node HDFS cluster and you have two partitions. Uh, to, uh, your MapReduce job just wrote two shards to it, and there's a physical mapping which is uh, each of them has both the partitions. Each machine has both the partitions, and they're serving the same partitions. So you have full data locality in this case. Uh, and your performance will be good. But let's say you added another node, and uh, HDFS uh, chooses to move uh, part, part one from machine M2 to, part, uh, to machine M3. So in this case, you have lost data locality. And so reads going to M2 will now get uh, routed to M3 uh, because of uh, HDFS uh, having to go uh, to, the, uh, to the respective data node. But then the controller loop will kick in after a few minutes. And it will make sure that we close the partition 0 on M2, which is no longer hosting that partition, and then open it on M3 so that you again have 100% data locality and you have good performance. Uh, so some of the wins of this architecture are like you get 100% block locality, and you're able to take advantage of short circuit local reads and HDFS optimizations like memory mapping and so on. Um, and uh, it's not necessary to operate this with block locality, but I mean, if you are if you really want to make sure that uh, your latencies are low, uh, that is the way to go. You get multiple serving replicas for each partition, which you wouldn't if you're using something like edge base. Uh, so that is also good for availability. Uh, the garbage collection is really cheap. Uh, you don't need to run compactions to get rid of old data. Uh, uh, all it does is 
just delete the older versions. Uh, the other thing is you can easily tweak the map reduce shards or the number of reducers across uh, across different jobs um, uh, or across different versions of the same data set. Uh, this is actually very helpful because our developers uh, they really like to tweak the number of map reduce uh, map reduce uh, reducers uh, to make their jobs run faster or uh, yeah just to actually make them run faster. Also, uh, you get faster uploads because you can now uh, directly upload to HDFS without having to go uh, to, uh, through a two-step process, like first generate the files and then distribute them over a bunch of servers, which we had to do in that Elephant DB style architecture. And I think the most important one is that you get the stability, elasticity, and scalability of HDFS and Hadoop. And this is especially important because uh, you know, data management systems uh, are typically uh, they have a lot of corner cases, particularly when you reach a certain scale. And um, HDFS and Hadoop are actually pretty proven technologies. And there's a very good chance that, I mean, the, the, there's, there's a fair amount of engineers in your company who already know, or like we have at Pinterest, who actually know how to operate HDFS. The corner cases are well understood. And you can, uh, there, there are lots of good resources um, on debugging uh, any issues with these systems. Uh, so I'll quickly talk about some of the features uh, that we implemented. So uh, file sets uh, are like namespaces. They are akin to tables in, uh, in the traditional database uh, terminology. So you can namespace your data by file sets. Uh, we do a live swap as a new version of the data is uploaded um, on a per file set basis. Uh, you can have multiple versions of a file set in serving. Uh, this is very good, uh, particularly uh, if you have a critical file set and you want the ability to roll back uh, fairly quickly to, um, uh, to some previous version, because maybe there's a software bug which might have caused uh, data corruption or something. Uh, the serving format we are currently using is edge files, but you can use uh, um, something that's more performant or, or is more targeted to your application. Uh, there's intrinsic support for Hadoop sharding functions, so you can um, just write data with, with the standard hash partitioner in Hadoop and have it uh, ingested by Terrapin. And also, um, we provide a batch get API, thrift API, which allows um, um, batching the keys uh, so you can get higher throughput. So yeah, I'll talk about um, our deployment of Terrapin at Pinterest. So we are using it for various features, uh, recommendations um, for, uh, for joins, like joining various pieces of data around users, uh, boards, and pins. We are using it for machine learning predictions, serving models, serving uh, large, uh, large, um, uh, large quantity of features. Uh, we are running on 300 plus nodes across uh, five clusters on EC2. Uh, we currently have, uh, yeah, I think this is a little bit dated. Uh, it's, it's now 60 terabytes um, and 180 terabytes with replication. We have around 100, uh, 100 different use cases dumping several terabytes of data every day into Terrapin as new versions of the data sets are being generated. Uh, the total number of partitions stored are more than 50,000. Uh, we're doing 1.5 million QPS at peak. Uh, the P99 as measured from the server side is less than 5 milliseconds. And uh, that's, uh, that's for SSD-backed hardware because we do, we do use uh, SSD machines on EC2 for some uh, for some of our clusters which are serving online traffic. Uh, also, we write edge files first to S3 and then uh, copy them to Terrapin. We would ideally like to directly write to Terrapin, but we're not doing that right now because uh, of some um, some version mismatch between our uh, between our Hadoop cluster that's running on our compute uh, compute clusters and our serving cluster which runs behind Terrapin. Uh, so uh, we have also done some optimizations for online workloads. Uh, so one of the optimizations is to uh, uh, throttle the data node to pin it to only use uh, one CPU core. The, uh, the advantage of that is uh, that you can make sure that your bulk uploads are throttled so that um, the Terrapin server, which is doing the live reads, has enough, has enough resources to uh, continue to serve uh, real user traffic with low latencies. Uh, and this has actually worked well for us. And we also use two clusters in two different availability zones. We upload to them sequentially to not, up, uh, to not overload them at the same time. We use speculative execution. So we uh, run a request against cluster A. And then if it doesn't come back fast enough, we spawn another one against cluster B. 
and pick the one that comes, comes back fast, uh, comes back sooner. Um, and then um, we are also running with a lower replication factor because you're using two clusters, so you don't want to store six copies of the data. Um, yeah, and, and, that, uh, and we have not found any issues so far uh, with that either. So we are ha excited to announce that we are open sourcing uh, Terrapin. So it's going to be available at github.com slash Pinterest slash Terrapin. Uh, we have tested it with Hadoop 2.7.1, which is the current stable version. Internally, we are running it on CDH 4.2. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can actually compile it with any Hadoop version. So if you have, if you're running 2.6, 2.3, 2.4, 5, it should compile against that. Um, uh, we are only supporting Hadoop 2 as of now. Um, so as part of the open source, there's a Hadoop output format to write, f uh, write data directly to Terrapin. You can load data in three modes, either uh, uh, write it on S3 or HDFS, and then upload it into Terrapin from there onwards, or write directly from a MapReduce job. Uh, also, uh, we, have, uh, we are including all the other advanced features, like being able to roll back, have multiple versions, have speculative failover across clusters as part of the open source. So uh, also, I mean, Terrapin actually, um, it provides a nice diagnostic UI. For example, this is, this is something coming from uh, one of our clusters around you know, the different kinds of data sets that people might be using. Uh, it shows the number of partitions that are currently online. Uh, there are some spam use cases, uh, when they were uploaded, where on, on HDFS these are kept. So we have like 90 different use cases for the specific cluster that I'm showing. And then you can also drill down into a particular uh, a file set or namespace and look at the mapping of partitions, where the data is being served from, um, uh, again, where it is stored uh, on HDFS, and then if there are any older versions that are stored, and so on and so forth. You can also query, the, uh, query each file set from this UI. And all this information is also exported through, a, uh, through an HTTP like matrix port, where you can you can get this data in, a, in an easy to parse format if you want to feed it into your matrix pipeline like OpenTSDB, uh, OpenTSDB or StatsD. So yeah, uh, I think there are some future plans like um, we would want to run Terrapin as a YARN app uh, because I mean that, that would greatly simplify uh, the deployment of Terrapin uh, because it's, it's supposed to run on an existing Hadoop cluster. Um, and then uh, beyond key value, we want to, want to move to like, more complex data structures, like it could be the sorted lists uh, so, or sorted sets or have um, like just time series data so you can scan portions of it and return back, uh, uh, back the aggregated response. Uh, then faster and targeted storage formats, say RocksDB SS tables, uh, which would be faster than H files or something very targeted like Bloom filters. And this should be very easy to do. Uh, with Terrapin because um, the storage format is extensible. And then there's one thing which, uh, which is not mentioned here is like a notion of external file sets. So what you can do is that you can write your data to any place on HDFS, and without having Terrapin to manage all the versioning, you can just have your data somewhere on HDFS and have it served by Terrapin as long as it's in the right format. Um, yeah, so I think there are some advantages to that, like you can, uh, you can manage the data on your own, and like anybody can just write any data uh, on HDFS and have it surveyable. And finally, we also have uh, a tool which lets you take Hive tables and upload them uh, into Terrapin um, and choose one of the columns, one or two of the columns as the key, and the rest of the columns as the value. Uh, so we, have, uh, we don't have it as part of the open source yet, but that's something we are planning to do in the future. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, if you guys are interested, you can check out github.com slash Pinterest slash Terrapin. It should have uh, documentation, uh, the source code, usage, and setup instructions. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. So we'll have time for a few questions. Any questions on Terrapin? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned it's easy to increase number of shards. Yeah. Uh, uh, how does the Helix controller do the swap when you're, it's a live system. Yeah, yeah. And now you're increased shards and it's swapping. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we actually create a new Helix resource. Uh, so the resources are independent across versions, basically. 
So there is one resource which is currently in serving, and then a new resource gets created uh, when a new version comes in, and the old one gets decommissioned over time. Yeah, you can't actually do it in the same. So there is some versioning logic that's built on top of uh, on top of the Helix part, which is uh, yeah, which is kind of a part of Terrapin and is not uh, is not in Helix. Yeah. And the clients get to know. Yes. So the clients get notified of the next version that's supposed to be served. More questions? OK, so I think Varun yes. will also be available at the office hours uh, yeah. outside for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. So let's thank Varun once again. Thank you, Varun. Thank you.